Christ. The glorious day, the glorious time, Father God, because of what Jesus did. We now become sons and daughters of the Most High God. We're in blood covenant with you. Father, we're forever grateful and thankful for your divine plan of redemption. Father, we'll give you all the glory and the praise and the honor, Father. In Jesus' name, we want to worship you, glorify you, magnify you, submit unto you. James 4, 7 says, submit unto God. So, Father, we submit unto you. And our Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Word of God. Now, Satan, in Jesus' name, we resist you. That means every one of your companions, your cohorts, your soldiers. We bind up anything out of this place and around this place that does not confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. You are loose from your assignment. You'll get away from here and out of here in Jesus' name. You will not block, stop the flow of the Word of God or the moving of the Holy Spirit and the anointings in Jesus' name. So, Father, we and we thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for being obedient, coming into this earth, emptying yourself out, the Word of God says. You became, a, you walked the earth as a man in the last Adam. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for becoming sin for us. We thank you for bearing our sickness and diseases on your body by those horrible beings that you took, the, the scourging. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. You loved us so much, you died and went to hell in our place. So we're forever for grateful, Lord Jesus Christ. We'll worship you for eternity. We want to glorify you and magnify you. And Jesus, you are the head. We're a part of your body. So therefore, Lord Jesus, you said in John 16, 13, how be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is coming, he will lead you and guide you into all truth, where he will show you things to come. So we expect them to be led by the spirit of God. Romans 8, 14 says those are the sons of God are led by the spirit of God. So we yield our spirits, Father God, to be led by your spirit, Father God. We ask for divine wisdom and revelation to your word, Father God. You open our eyes. We may see our ears. We may hear what the spirit of God is saying and doing. We thank you, Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We do ask for utterances day in the Holy Ghost, Father, in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father God for the ministering of your word. So we glorify you and magnify you. And Father, we do covet the best gift, 1 Corinthians 12, 31. And we also despite, desire spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians 14, 1. In Jesus' glorious name, and the saints said, amen, amen, amen. amen. You can be seated. No, really, I, the last 45 minutes before we came here, I think like everything went at home, everything went wrong. I, everything. I even jabbed myself with a knife. I've never done that in my life. And then I couldn't stop bleeding. I'm trying to put on my trousers and my tie and everything else. I'm going, I'm bleeding like a stuck hog. <laughs> so I die and bring some band-aids. Yeah. See, I'm a blood thinner. I've been on for about four years, I guess. Uh, you know, that, I never bleed that much. You want to get stuck for uh, blood blood tests, you know, for the medication I was on. So but anyway, it kept bleeding and bleeding. I'm going, dear Lord in heaven. <laughs> Yep, I am. And uh, couldn't find my suspenders. Keep in the same place every time. And I'm rushing, throwing around stuff. I found a new pair I bought years ago. They were still in the, in the bag yet, so I got them out this morning. <laughs> it, it was it was just something else. Try, trying to put on my shoes and socks. It was just, really, really? The devil, you're fighting pretty hard. So <laughs> we don't give in to the devil. But anyway, this is, we're celebrating Resurrection Sunday. And uh, I know, and I don't mean to be controversial, but I'm going to be scriptural. We do not celebrate Easter. There's no such thing as Easter. In fact, the only time you ever see it in the King James Bible is in, first, in Acts chapter 12, verse 4. It talks about the word, the only time in the Bible it says the word Easter, but then in good Bibles, you'll see a little mark by it in the, in the margin, it'll say Passover. So as we turn to, see, it, it didn't turn Easter until three, uh, 325 A.D. under Constantine. But then, uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Again, we want to be scriptural and we want to do things God's way because man man has gotten in and started changing things throughout the centuries. What did I say? A five, yeah. 1 Corinthians 5. And uh, when man changes things, remember Jesus said in Matthew 15 and, and Mark 7, for the doctrines of men, you make the word of God a none effect. So your doctrines, they have to be in line with what the word of God says. Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse uh, 7 and 8, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly an unleavened. You are truly unleavened. For indeed Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Verse 8, Therefore let us keep the feasts. See, the New Testament church started out. They all kept the feasts because, remember, we, when we've gone back to Leviticus 23, it talks about the, the seven feasts. Those aren't feasts of the Jewish people. They're feasts of the Lord. They're the Lord's feasts. They're continually carried on and carried out. But we, but after 300 A.D., things got changing. They don't no longer 
uh, uh, recognize the feast. They do things their own way and have different different things in the, they they indoctrinated pagan worship and pagan things in the body of Christ in the church world. That should not be. Well, but see, people weren't taught. See, we in most time in most churches. Every year at this time, it's the same ritual. Same, you hear the same message, the same thing all the time. It's just that's the only time you hear it. I guess one thing I did like about the Catholic Church, they each time you went back and you, but they went up to the cross all the time. So it kept you a remembrance of what Jesus did. See, Jesus is no longer on the cross, but he paid a horrible, horrific price for you and I. He bought us. First Corinthians six and twenty. He said, the "Bible says we've been bought with a price." <coughs> Oh, I'm here for a reason. <laughs> so I'm going to stand on this side of the table today. So <clears throat> this happened up in Rockford years ago when um, uh, I was teaching on a Wednesday night up there. Well, up in Rockford on Wednesday and Sundays. But there was a woman in our uh, had to come. Uh, she had MS. And uh, anyway, the Lord said, every time you come, have her sit on the end row. You go down and start, they just stand there and preach right, don't have to lay hands on her, they stand there and preach right beside her. As I did after a period of time, MS totally left. But see, you have to obey what God says to do. So the, the, anointings, the anointings are ever present. So you just need to do is bask in the anointing and just receive it. So anyway, uh, but, but so if we, because when we've talked about here, 1 Corinthians 5 and 8, let us continue the feast. Well, in Exodus chapter 12, when God initiated the Passover with the blood of the killing of the Passover lamb, etc., that ritual, people didn't realize, see, again, when we talked about the, the different feasts of the Lord, well, feast has two words in the Hebrew. One is, <laughs> come on now, moed, which means an appointed or set time. The other word is mikra, which means a dress rehearsal. So for every year, all the time, the, every time you do a feast, it's a dress rehearsal for a future event. So all the times they were doing Passover, they never understood what Passover really meant to a point, why the killing of the lamb and the putting of the blood on the doorposts and lentils, they didn't understand that. And when they went to have the Passover meal, as they brought the, the, the matzah out, which I wanted to have today, but we couldn't find matzah around Davenport. I don't know why, but anyway, anyway. Uh, Last minute, that's too late. But anyway, I was going to show you what what happened. But anyway, there were, they would every Passover meal they would have the the matzah in a in a, in a cloth brought, uh, What's the name of that? Not a name, but it is woven cloth. But there were three compartments to it. Anyway, for years they always thought the Jewish thought people thought it was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but it actually it was Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So the night that Jesus took out. When he had the Passover, he took out the middle compartment, which they never did. They couldn't, they couldn't understand, understand why he kept breaking Isaac all the time. But it wasn't Isaac. It was Jesus. Because Jesus broke it and said, this is my body, the one you've been proclaiming. This is, I'm the Passover lamb. And therefore, he said, when you eat, that, eat this bread. So anyway, so the things of God are meant to be there for a divine purpose. Everything that God does has a divine purpose and a reason for it. We may not always understand the purposes or the reason, but it's there for it. It, it, it is. And there's so many mysteries, as I've been studying back in, in the feast and different things, uh, there's so many things about the Passover meal and also about the cross. and different, So many things, there's so much in depth that we have not never been taught to those degrees, but it's, it's in the Word. It's always been there. God... God is a specific God. God doesn't do things just by chance. So anyway, <clears throat> we're going to do a little quick review, I think, till I get to the point of first, we're celebrating first fruits today because Jesus is the first fruit. But before we get back, we want to bring a little bit of back of memory for what we talked about a little bit about last week and about the, the Passover, because <clears throat> it's still Passover week. But anyway, when, when, uh, <coughs> Okay, I had all these th things down in the exact order, Friday and Saturday. Woke up this morning at four thirty. I don't have any more, so I'm I'm just going to have to go with what comes up. So so I hope I don't mess things up. Anyway, listen, we're going to take you back to to the Passover meal what Jesus celebrated with his disciples. That's why when he 
set the, I want to celebrate this meal with you before I am sacrificed. Now, he had told them throughout the years and different times, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Once I be lifted up, I draw all men unto myself. But he said, I will die and I will raise you again after the third day. And we, he gave me some scriptures. Actually, I'll give them to you again if you need them. But Jesus did not die on Friday. It's impossible. Three days and three nights? No. When he died in Matthew or Luke or John chapter 19 and verse 31, the day he died was a high Sabbath. Because when throughout the years when they saw Sabbath, the Sabbath is always on a Saturday. But they have different Sabbaths that goes in between. But this was a high Sabbath, a special Sabbath. So when you figure out that when he died on the cross at three o'clock, then at six, see the Jewish time and God's time, the day starts at 6.01 p.m. We start at 12.01 a.m. So you figure when he died, three days, three nights, he was resurrected early Sunday morning. So it couldn't have been Friday. But again, that's tradition. That's been that way for well, 1700, almost 1,700 years. But anyway, and we thought that was okay, but it didn't, it didn't add up. Even before I you guys, and you read the scriptures three days and three nights, I'm going, how can this be? I'm no, I'm no mathematician. I'm no great, great scholar, but that didn't add up. But anyway, when we go to the Word, the Word will explain what day it was and what happened. And what, you know, it wasn't what man has traditionally done for all these thousands of years. But anyway, when Jesus had the covenant with his, with his disciples, and he said, this is my body. And he took that bread. He said, this, was, this is my body, which is broken for you. This is before his scourging. This is before his whipping and beating. And he said, take heed of this. This is my body. Then he took the cup. And the cup he took, what we talked about a little bit, not too much on Wednesday night, but I, I want to teach more on the Passover meal. And it was too much to get out in that short of time, so a lot of things were kind of slammed together. That's my fault. But anyway, uh, there was at a, at a Passover meal, there's always four cups. The first cup is a cup of thanksgiving. The second cup is a cup of judgment. Well, remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? And he's laying there and he said, he prayed and he said, Lord, if I be thou will take this cup of suffering from me. That was the second cup, the cup of suffering. So he had to suffer for you and I, because if he hadn't suffered, we still we still be in our sins. So, but anyway, he took he took to the cup. But when he okay. He said, one of you this night is going to betray me. Whoever dips with me in the, it wasn't the moth or the sop, but it was, they had two different bowls, or a bowl of bitters, which was horseradish, ground up. The other was the sweet, which was fruit and, and, and nuts. You take your matzah, well, first for the bitter, they, they do the bitter first. They dip it in the bitter, take a bite off the matzah. Show their bitter, their suffering when they were in Egypt, all the things they went through, the torment. Then they would take the other piece of matzo, they would dip it in the sweet and the bitter. So there was there's sweetness to the bitterness of what they went through. <clears throat> so when Judas <clears throat> took part of that, Jesus broke it off, gave it to him, he ate it. <clears throat> the Bible says that Satan entered Judas. So he sought for a way to then betray because the high priests wanted, wanted to get Jesus before the courts. They wanted to have him crucified the Roman way because of what they could have done because of the Jewish law for what he had proclaimed, they could have stoned him to death under their laws. But they wanted him humiliated. They wanted him to be, everything about him, his reputation, everything to be so totally ruined. And when they, of course, when they hung him, the Roman crucifixion was the most diabolical of the time. It was it was horrible. Uh, they they not only stripped him naked, they, he wasn't, they didn't, there was no cloth on the, on, the, on the cross. But they would either, uh, uh, Decapitate them, or they would cut them up. Or they, they, they were, these were people who were so diabolical in the way they did they, but they, they did it. They wanted to humiliate a person so bad because when he died, the crucifixion was only for criminals. So he died the death of a criminal. He never did one thing wrong. So that's why after then, after he ate with them, he, he said, "This is the, this is my meal." So when we have a when we receive communion, we should do it respectfully and not just as a haphazard, it's not a big deal. Yes, it is a big deal. This, this means something. When we take that broken bread, 
And Jesus said, this represents my body, which is broken for you. When you drink of that cup, he said, this represents my blood, which is shed for you in remission for many, only those that receive it. So that means you come in a covenant with God. So it's a covenant meal, covenant sacrifice. We keep going back and putting God in remembrance and also ourselves, what Jesus has done for us and who we are, who we belong to. So communion should not be just a haphazard thing or ah, maybe we do it, maybe we don't. No, there's something very vital and important. But see, again, <clears throat> the church world has gotten kind of desensitized to the communion as they had to the cross. Because when you only think of the cross, thank you, sir. God bless you. When you only think of the cross, a one-time thing, and, and, and a lot of people think, well, Jesus, when he died on the cross, he died as the Son of God. No, he did not. <clears throat> he died as a man. But he, he suffered that pain. But anyway, the, the, what he went through then on that cross, well, I better get to the cross. Before I get to the cross, let's go to, let's back up a little bit. When the Jews, the Jews when they did come and get him after he had prayed the three times, and he said, arise, because the disciples were sleeping. He told him, he said, no, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We have to put our flesh under. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 27, he said, I put my body under. Who's I? The spirit, the real you, the one on the inside. <clears throat> Where was I going, Diane? <laughs> bring it back, Lord, bring it back. He will, he will, he will. <clears throat> What? I, I can't hear. What did you say? Put your flesh under. Put your flesh under. Crucify the flesh. Crucify the flesh. Thank you. He's paying. They're paying attention. <clears throat> but so that's what we, you and I are supposed to do. So that's so we, we go through communion. We're recognizing what Jesus did and what we, we how important it is to God. It's not just a trivial thing. But then after he. After they came to get him, and we see it in, in John's Gospel, chapter 18, when Judas was bringing them, because Judas knew where Jesus would be at praying. And of course, when they come to him in John, John chapter 18, and he, Jesus said, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am. When he said, I am, they all fell to the ground. And again, he said, who are you looking for? They said, he said, I am. He, I'm, but they let him off. And the high priests and the Pharisees and the elders they ask him all these kinds of questions, you know, and uh, who are you and different things, and are you the son of God? And, and of course, th they got so mad, they said, well, this is all we need to do, you know, or turn him over to Pilate. So they let, when the high priest led Jesus to Pilate, they led him with a rope around the neck. As you do the Passover lamb, when you bring him into the, to, to the temple before sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb, they do it with a rope, they lead him in, the high priest leads him in. These priests, would, not knowing what they were doing, they were leading the perfect Passover lamb to be slayed. So they take him to Pilate. Pilate didn't really want him to do it, but Pilate wanted to be, he's a politician. You know how that goes. Anyway, they brought him and he said, he's this, this, and this. And Pilate says, I find nothing wrong with him. I'll crucify him. And Pilate, then finally in there, they said, he's a Galilean. He thought, oh, Galilee, I'll send him over to Herod. Because he wanted to get rid of it because his wife had already sent him a note in Matthew's Gospel 20. Chapter 27 had nothing to do with this man. I've had a horrible night with him and I'm troubled, so don't do anything about him. So, not paraphrasing it. So, he sent him over to Herod because Herod really wanted to see him because Herod wanted to know. He heard all these things about Jesus healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out devils. And of course, Herod uh, questioned Jesus and he got mad at Jesus, sent him back to Pilate. Pilate again going under the, under the well, first one, Pilate, when Pilate said, I find nothing wrong with him, that was it. That should have been court. Court was closed. That's it. Case closed. But the Jews kept pushing him and pushing him. He said, "Well, I find out, so I'll scourge him, and then I'll turn turn him loose." So he had him scourged, which we know that the diabolical. We talked a little bit about how the bad with that cat of nine tails was when he scourged him, beat him, whipped him. In fact, Matthew or Isaiah fifty two and fourteen, and Isaiah fifty two and believe it two and three talks about he was marred so bad you couldn't even tell he was a human being. He wasn't recognizable. That's how bad he was. That's what punishment he took for our healing. For our healing. Amen. Uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> I 
these little side journeys getting me, getting me off. I'm trying, I'm trying to think where I'm going. I didn't, don't need to think. I need to smell the Holy Ghost. <clears throat> so anyway, the pilot, pilot had him scourged, put the, put the purple robe on him, and brought him out, and, he, and they said, crucify him, crucify him. So he ends up turning Barabbas, who was a mean guy, a horrible guy, and they, they wanted Jesus crucified. Well, Pilate, before he said, he took a bowl of water, washed his hands, said, this man's blood is off. I'm claiming this man's blood. The Jews said, let his blood be upon us and our generations. Well, it was. And they didn't realize. See, they hated it. But see, Pilate knew they were so jealous of him, and they envied him so much, but he had him crucified. So as he walked, of course, he went to go to the cross, and, and Simon, the Cyrene, uh, Syrian, uh, Cyrene, Cyrenian, carried the cross for Jesus. And uh, anyway, they nailed him to the cross. Of course, we know the cross was such a horrible thing. I've talked a little bit about it. But that cross, he for six hours, from 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock, he had to push up on his heels to breathe because when you're down in the way you were, you, you can't breathe. So he had to push up. So you get air in your lungs. And then after a while, you collapse back down. Well, every time you do that, and I said, I think I said last week, because when your hands are out in the cross that way and you're, you're nailed down, but after the back and forth, back and forth. After a while, your your shoulders come out of their joints. Then your elbows come out of your joints. After a while, your arms are nine inches longer than normal. See, we didn't never knew that before, but it's a whole how horrible, diabolical the crucifixion was. And, then, and of course, they're mocking him. Of course, the Jews are mocking too. And he starts crying out, Eli, Eli. And they thought, well, he's calling for Elijah to come. He said, well, if he's God, let him, let him save himself. So they're mocking him all the time. And, and you're, and they have two soldiers at the foot of the cross. They have to guard him so nobody comes in and rushes and takes him down from the cross. Well, anyway, we know that then at, at uh, 12 o'clock, there was a great darkness. I mean, a darkness over the earth. Well, and Jesus started crying out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. In other words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the first time in his total existence he was ever separated from God. And his spirit, not only just the flesh. I mean, he, he, in heaven, he wasn't spirit, flesh, he's a spirit. That's why we, we know that he died the deaths on the cross because in Isaiah 53 and 9, if you check out the Hebrew and my King, King James uh, Cambridge Bible translation, says in his deaths, plural, two times. See, the first Adam died first spiritually, then second physically. Jesus died spiritually, he died physically. Spiritual death is separation from God. It doesn't mean you're annihilated. When a person dies, you don't, you don't just there's nothing anymore. You're not dead. I mean, you're just you're gone forever. No, your body may lay down, but your spirit either goes to heaven or hell. One of the two. Well, when he died, the deaths on the cross, and we know that at three o'clock, the exact same time, the high priest sacrificed the lamb on the altar with a knife. He slit its throat. That's the exact same time Jesus said, "Father, into your hands I commit my spirit." He said, "It is finished." That moment, the high priest said, "It is finished." That means their sins were covered for a year. But Jesus, when he said it is finished, the old covenant was finished. The new covenant came into effect. So all the rituals before that, because when he died on the cross, there was a great earthquake. and The temple curtain was ripped in two from top to bottom. That means the approach to God is different now. You, you as a normal person or lay person, you couldn't go in. You could go in the outer court or the inner court. You could not go in the holiest of holies. Only the high priest could go in there. But now you and I are temples of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 17, 1 Corinthians 6 and 19, and 2 Corinthians 6 and 14. The Holy Spirit resides on the inside of us. So one of us kept locked up so holy in there. And we know what happened to, to Aaron's two sons when they made a false fire. They died in there. Well, see, you and I, we have, well, wherever we go, we have to realize who's on the inside of you. Wherever you go, God goes. Yeah. If you go to a place you shouldn't be going, you're taking God right along with you. Well, he'll never see it. Well, <laughs> he's in you. He knows exactly what you're doing. But, but again, the church has gotten desensitized to things about who they are in Christ Jesus. They don't know who they are, what, they, what Jesus did for them. We're supposed to be followers of Christ. He's, our, he's the head, we're the body. We're supposed, he's our example. We're supposed to follow his ways. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Well, when we get the first time they ever used the word Christian was in the book of Acts, because Christian means little anointed one. Christ means the anointed, or the Messiah's anointing with his anointings. Well, we're called Christians. That means little anointed ones. That's exactly what Satan saw on the day of Pentecost. At one time, Jesus was the only one anointed with the Holy Ghost and power. But when 
day of Pentecost came, 120 got the baptism in the Holy Ghost, and that's they saw their spirits were see a spirit a demon they can see the spirit they can they look past your flesh. Then now he saw 120 little Jesuses out there. Then later on was 3,120. Then pretty soon another 5,000 were added. So we we need to realize who we are, what God has done for us. But anyway, when he died on the cross and he thrust that spear into his side, Golgotha is called the place of the skull. Well, for years I heard different pastors, different ones talk about it's probably a uh, uh, Goliath skull, no. As I started studying, going back into some of the Hebrew and early church writings, that's exactly where they buried Adam. So when Jesus died and there was a great earthquake, his blood symbolically went down over top of Adam's skull, nullifying what Adam had done and caused in this world. Jesus undid it with his blood. See, from Adam, because of Adam, sin came into the world, but also Death came into the world. Well, there never would have been death if Adam, had, Adam hadn't sinned. That's why John Hagee says when he gets to heaven, he's going to kick Adam right in the shins. <laughs> now, I, we're so much love, I doubt that's going to happen. But you might ask him a question. Hey, dude, what you do? What was wrong with you? But anyway, but, so symbolically, in fact, they have the, the church of the Holy Sepulcher. There is a church right now inside the temple. That was Joseph of Arimathea's um, tomb. And it was only rich people could have a tomb like that, but so hewed out, uh, hewed out, hewed out. If we're here anyway, you'll get it <laughs> done inside. Now they've got a, there's a church down there. I mean, it looks like it's really beautiful, the high temple uh, ceilings, and everything else. But off the one wall, there's a plate glass thing, but you see this crack where there was it from that, still from that earthquake 2,000 years ago. So again, symbolically, I believe that's what, and I, I, I go on with the early church writing, I think that's. Because God doesn't do things by chance. The last Adam paid the price for the first Adam's transgressions and disobedience. The first Adam was disobedient. The last Adam was obedient. Even to the point, Philippians 2 and 8, even to the point of death, death on the cross, which was the most horrendous type of a death. So Jesus did so much, and Christians say, well, you know, I'll go to church on Sunday and a few things, but that's, you know, I'm still going to do my own thing. Well, you may want to do your own thing, but you're going to keep separating yourself from God and the blessings from God. We can't be blessed if we're doing our own thing. We're supposed to, Jesus is the chief shepherd. We're the sheep. He's placed me here as an under shepherd. I have to follow him. But I'm supposed to, as John chapter 21, I'm supposed to feed the sheep, take care of the sheep. That's my job. If I don't, then I have to answer for it. <coughs> So I have to teach you what the Word of God says, not what man thinks or what someone else, well, our tradition says this. Well, that offends me. Well, get offended. I don't care. But when I got offended different times, a couple times, I had to go back to the Word because that's where the answers were. And twice I found out I was wrong. You believe that, Diane? Oh, yeah. Me being wrong? <laughs> twice in my life. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, but when you have a disagreement with about things about what well I don't believe in that well go back to what the word says line upon line precept upon precept it's in here the Holy Ghost will bring it to you see God will get it God will get it to you if he can get it through you but a lot of people get why well, uh, I don't that's too much that's that's too heavy right. no nah, I don't want to go there well remember in Proverbs I gave you about two or three weeks ago ignorance is no excuse you can't say well I didn't know you have access to the Word of God. Nowadays, you have technology on 24 hours a day. You can hear preaching, teaching 24 hours a day. Back in the, back in the uh, early 70s, I think it was Len Mink, wasn't it? Was that in the 70s? Yeah. Len Mink was with Kenneth Hagin and Kenneth Copeland for all those years. But he was drinking so bad, but he was going to kill himself. He had a shotgun loaded. He was going to blow his head off. Well, he had, happened to have a TV on in that room he was in. I think it was a motel room. And Kenneth Copeland was on. The guy got born again. He was going to commit suicide. People get so frustrated in suicide. What happened to Judas after he betrayed Jesus? He realized, see, someone said, I saw on Facebook, did, Jesus, did Judas repent? Well, the Bible says he did. So they question, is he going to be in heaven? I have no idea. Jesus said it would be better if he was never born. 
But when he took that, he took that money. He found out what was going to happen. He just thought he'd get the thirty pieces of silver. Like he was, he was the treasurer. He was in charge of money. So when he left after he he ate the bread that Jesus gave him, and they and he took off the other disciples. And, well, he must go out to buy more bread because he has the money bag. Jesus had had a ministry. They took they took up offerings. Hello, <coughs> a poor man doesn't need a treasurer. But anyway, so. Uh, they, th they thought he was going to, going to go buy something. But anyway, uh, in fact, when, when Mary put the expensive perfume on him, poured over his head first and washed his feet and wiped over their hair, of course, it was Judas that said, we could have sold that money. It was that, that would have been worth a year's wages to a person. He said, you, Jesus said, you always have the poor with you. She's done this for my burial. But he told them over and over again, I'm going to suffer and die, but I'll meet you ahead of time in Galilee. But when this, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself now, but anyway, after he was crucified, they're all in mourning. They're all just emotional. Well, the two women that went down to the cave, they get down there, and of course, the stone was rolled up. But once the stone was there, the Jews went to Pilate and said, you know, he talked about maybe, you know, maybe his disciples will steal him, said he's risen from the dead. So they had it, they had the stone sealed. So in other words, if that seal is broken, you not only go to jail, you probably end up being murdered or crucified for what you did. So when the women get down there, they see the stone is open, the stone is rolled away, the tomb is open, and there's this big angel sitting on the on the stone. I mean, he's like he was sitting in a chair. So they go inside, and there's a, another little, a younger angel in there, and said, he's not here. We read Matthew's, or Luke's account, Luke 24, uh, then they, later on they see two more angels. So they had four angels meet them. Anyway, they said, what are you looking for the dead, among, living among the dead for? He's not here. He said he'd meet you in Galilee. He said after three days, again, the angel said for three days, he would rise again. I'll meet you in Galilee. Well, they went back and told the disciples, the 11. They didn't, but only two of them wanted to go check it out, Peter and John. They take off, Peter takes off running. Of course, John's younger. John, John is faster. John beat him to the altar. John got to the stone. It's rolled away. John stops. Here comes Peter. <laughs> Peter was, you know, kind of Kind of a different type of guy, you know. Even though they deny you, Lord, I'll never. Yeah, he said before the cock crows three times, you'll deny me. Peter runs right on in there, just head head first. We get in there, of course. Jesus in there. Eventually, John gets in there. You go back and tell the other disciples they don't believe. It. They're still mourning. He's not there. What what happened to him? So when Jesus did appear to him later on, he rebuked him. He said. What's, where's your faith? I told you I'd be meet you three days later in Galilee. And of course, later on we find out in John's gospel, Thomas wasn't there when he appeared to the, to the, to the eleven, uh, most of them. I should say ten, because Judas is already gone. Anyway, Judas said, "Unless I," because he heard what the other disciples said. He said, "Unless I can see the holes in his hands and his feet and put my fingers through his side, I'm not going to believe." That's why we call him doubting Thomas. And Jesus appeared, and Thomas said, oh, my Lord and my God. He said, touch me here. He said, put your fingers here and in my side. Well, Thomas believed because he saw. But Jesus said, blessed are those that believe and not see. Faith comes in. Faith begins where the will of God is known. If you don't know God's will, you're never going to have faith for anything. But anyway, I went back a little summary. I don't know if I went too far. <laughs> I probably left some things out. But anyway. Because it's first fruits, and Jesus was, was resurrected, he was resurrected on Sunday morning. So Sunday is what? The first day of the week. It's not Monday. Monday, as that's, that's, that's a Gregorian uh, calendar type thing. The first day of the week is Sunday. Monday is the first maybe work day or first, first work day, but it's not the first day of the week. But he was resurrected on a Sunday morning. Well, when they when they sacrificed or they celebrated first fruits, they would bring in an uh, offering for the harvest, They'd bring in a sheath of and bring it to the priest. The priest would wave it. Because if you don't bring it in the first fruits, you're not going to have anything after that. There's no blessing there. You won't have a crop after that. So Jesus, let's go to we're in First Corinthians 15, or First Corinthians over chapter 15. Verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep or those who, who uh, are not 
physically on the earth anymore. Again, remember when Lazarus was in the grave in John, John chapter 11? And uh, he came there, and of course, before he went there, he heard that Lazarus was, was uh, sick, and, and Jesus said, well, he'll, he'll be all right. He, 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 he sleepeth. And they said, well, if he sleeps, he'll wake up. And Jesus said, no, he's dead. See, they, his body was asleep. The spirit was still alive. But anyway, he called Lazarus out, and Lazarus came forth. You know, but Martha said beforehand, Lord, it's been four days. He stinks by now. He said, I am the resurrection, and I am the life. Though a man die, yet shall he live. Your spirits are eternal. God is a spirit. You were created in God's image and God's likeness. God is a spirit being. So your spirits are alive forever. Anyway, when Jesus rose from the dead as the first fruits, if we go back, okay, I'm going to show it to you. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 27 real quick. Matthew 27 and verse, what am I doing? 26. Okay. 27. Verse 52 and 3, I believe it is. Well, let's go over verse 51. And behold, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. As I said, that, that, place, that rock is that splitting is still there yet today. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Then coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now, <clears throat> let's go back to 1 Peter. Hey, Diane, remind me of one more thing here. I've got two things going here. Uh, the Passover blood in the, on the doorpost. Remind me of that. <laughs> Where am I going here? First Peter chapter and three. Uh, let's start with verse. Uh, that's in Second Peter. Start with verse. Uh, let's start with verse eighteen. For Christ also suffered once for sins, that he, and the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive or quickened in the spirit, quickened by the spirit or in the spirit, or to be made alive. Those and he all also went and preached to the spirits in prison who were formerly disobedient when they were once divine, uh, divine long suffering. God waited for uh, the days of Noah and the ark being prepared, in which a few being saved, which is eight and all through water, which is a type of anti type of, of salvation. In other words, water baptism does not save anybody. Chapter four of Peter, verse six For this reason, the gospel is preached also to those who are dead, they might be judged according to the men in the flesh. And live according to God in the Spirit. So when Jesus, before he came up out of one compartment of hell, which were, remember the rich man and Lazarus, Luke 16? The rich man was in hell. Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. There's a great gulf between them. Abraham and all the saints were had to be in they weren't Their spirits weren't alive unto God. Jesus had to go preach to those in Abraham's bosom. Those were the ones that came up with Jesus when he was resurrected. In fact, Acts chapter 1 and verse 9 says when he was resurrected, he was taken up into a cloud. It wasn't a cirrus cloud or a rain cloud. It was a cloud of witnesses. So those that had been, because before, before Jesus ascended, the first one born from the dead, see, there's, there's a firstborn, there's a secondborn, there's a thirdborn, there are millions born. If you're born again, you're a child of God, your spirit's alive unto God now, you're a child of God. But Jesus was the first fruit if he hadn't died, when he came into the earth during at Christmas time, we celebrate his birth, that was a great thing. But if he just came into the earth, was born and left, wouldn't done you know, one bit of good. He had to come suffer and die to pay the price for sin and spiritual death. If he hadn't, you'd either have to be a Jewish proselyte or you'd end up in hell. The bad compartment. But he went and preached to those that were... Abraham, Abraham had to be preached to, the father of faith. But when, when 2,000 years before Jesus died, when, when Adam, or Adam, when Abraham took his son three day journey up on Mount Moriah to be sacrificed, because he trusted God, he, in fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, around verse 19, Abraham saw his son being resurrected in a vision. But what he saw was Jesus Christ being resurrected. But he was going to kill his son and burn him up. 
But when God, when in fact, when Isaac being 20 years of age, so that means Abraham was about 120 when this happened. Isaac jumped on the altar, free, free will, free will. He was tied on the altar. Abraham's getting ready to, and the angel said, "Stop!" Well, he stopped, and he looked, and there was a lamb caught in the, in the bushes, a ram caught in the bushes. That's when Abraham said, "That is the Lord, our provider, Jehovah Rapha." What he's actually said was, "Not only provide for us all the time, the Lord will provide a lamb." Jesus was the lamb two thousand years later. The providing of a lamb. Jesus was our sacrificial lamb. So all these things that seem kind of mediocre or different things, we don't understand all the things. Everything God does is exact. Everything has something behind it. Specifically, dynamically, we need to get the revelation of what God does, what God has done for us, what Jesus did, what Jesus still does for us, because he's alive, more alive unto him. And we're supposed to be getting ready to usher him back in for the, for the rapturing of the church. We have a part to play, so we're supposed to do our part but we have to follow the leading of the Lamb. We have to be following the Holy Ghost and following what the Word of God says. There's many things that we're supposed to do. We have to do those things. Well, they've been saying that for thousands of years. Yeah. But some things couldn't happen. Number one, until Israel became a nation, 1948. Then they, Jerusalem, they took control back over Jerusalem again in 67, the Six Day War. Oh, God is a God. God is so. He's so awesome. There was a song years ago, Our God's an Awesome God. He, he's more, I don't know if a better word than awesome, but he's the best, magnificent, dynamic, whatever. He's everything. He's, everything. He's, he's the greatest, best. I mean, there's no words in the natural, in the English language that I don't know if I could use, but anyway, so when we should be looking to Resurrection Sunday, be so thankful what Jesus did for us and what God provided forced through the plan of redemption that we shouldn't take our salvation lightly. We should be so thankful on our daily basis. When you wake up in the morning, thank God. Well, God has promised you a long life if you know how to keep and obtain long life, but if you don't, you don't, the devil will steal it. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It doesn't just happen. You have to work the word. I have to work the word. I don't, and I, listen to what I'm saying. I don't, I'm not trying to be braggadocious. But when I go to the gym, I work the word. Saturday I went, and I usually do 60 minutes hard cardio. Well, I did 75 on the arc, which is so much harder than what I usually do 30 on one, 30 or 40 on the other one. I decided, I must, in Jesus' name, now I'm 81 years old. Do I have to do that? Do I need to? No. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I can do this. One guy, one, one of our good friends, was bragging, he said, I'm 74. He's, he, he does a good thing. But he doesn't keep up with me. But I have to work the word. So they're working in every area of your life, not just in the physical part, but in every part. The word always works, but you got to work the word. You have to put the word into motion. You have to believe the word in your heart. Speak it with your mouth. Then act on it. Do it. If we don't, it doesn't come to pass. And people get, well, God, maybe he said no this time. No, because his promises are all yes and amen, right? Yeah and nay. Can you breathe better? Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So we serve a God who's more than, we serve a living God. Not a God that's off somewhere and abandons us or some, some kind of a figment of somebody's imagination. We serve a God who is alive. Amen. So this, this Resurrection Sunday, I wish, I wish I had time to go back to everything with the Passover and the depth of that, all the things with that, that's the four different cups, what they meant, and the food, what that all meant, and even the lamb, what the lamb meant. Uh, but when we, oh yeah, you didn't, talk, you didn't remind me. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Remember when they were told in, in, in Exodus chapter 12 to put the blood of the Passover lamb on the doorpost and on the lintel on top. So what they did, and they were supposed to, they had to roast the lamb outside. They couldn't boil it. They had, they had to roast it outside, take it into the house. So they went in under the blood 
and had the part the lamb in them. You and I, we go to the cross. The cross is the door. We partake. We have Christ in us. The Bible says, I think it's First Colossians 1, 17, I think it's 27. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So as they, they had the protection with the blood, we have protection with the blood. We have the lamb in us. Oh, think about that. Think, just think for a minute about your temple, the Holy Ghost. God, before, before Christ died, you had no access. You had to go to a high priest. You had to go to a priest. You had to offer sacrifices every year. That only lasted for a year. And after you made the sacrifice, if you sinned, you were done for another year. You had to wait for another sacrifice. But with Jesus, we don't have to wait. That doesn't give you a license to sin. But 1 John 1, 7 and 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's just to forgive us and cleanse us from all sin and all unrighteousness. Amen. Whew. See, the, the blood under the old covenant was an atoning factor. It covered. Jesus' blood doesn't cover. It annihilates it. It, it destroys it. Totally, that's why he had the perfect blood. The perfect spotless lamb. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 1, around verse 18, he said, I'm a Peter, I'm going Verse 19, or verse, verse 18, you were redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition of your fathers, but, but, that's conjunction, with the precious blood of Christ, the Lamb without blemish and without spot. He was foreordained before the foundation of the world and was made manifest in his last days to you. God had a plan. Jesus was obedient to that plan. Jesus loved you and I so much. He suffered. He was when he walked the earth. He was humiliated. He was rejected. He was hated. And he was, but then he was scourged, beaten, put on a cross, hung there for six hours, trying to breathe. In fact, after you, after you couldn't push up anymore, you, you you'd suffocate in your own in your own body body fluids. That's how horrible that was. So when the, when the soldier pierced that spear into his side, blood and water come out. They knew he was already dead, because if it made a gush, gushing sound, it means he was still alive yet. So his blood went down that crack. See, God, God is so good. Jesus said, God is a good God. Oral Roberts used to always say that. He used to make ministers mad. I don't understand that. I guess, I guess they think God was a bad God. I don't know. But anyway. So anyway, we were partake of communion. Yeah. <coughs> oh, bless you. <laughs> Be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 11. When Jesus, Paul, Paul said in verse 23, he said, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed. So remember, Judas betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Took the bread. When he given thanks, broke it and said, this, take eat, this is, or this represents my broken body for you do in remembrance of me. So every time we partake of communion, we should remember the strength horrible price just that so we could be sound and healed and whole and free physically mentally the same man he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood this do as often you drink it drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup you proclaim the lord's death till he comes therefore whoever eats this bread or drinks of this cup in an unworthy manner be drinking uh, will be, be guilty of the body and the blood of the lord but let a man examine himself and let him eat of that bread and drink of that Drink of that cup. Thank you. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, or this cause, many are sick, many are weak, many die. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. So, <clears throat> thank God Jesus took the judgment. Well, we're, we're save that one. <laughs> he 
No, we will we'll judge ourselves first of all. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, First John 1, 7, 9, you said we would confess our sins. So, Father God, we come before you this, this day, Father God, we're so grateful and thankful that you're our Father, Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, our Heer, Redeemer, Deliverer, Baptizer, and our goals. We thank you, Father God, because of what Jesus did for us, that we may be in right standing, right place with you, continue that our sins are totally gone. So, Father God, we judge ourselves. We judge ourselves in every area, Father God, of sins of omission, sins of commission, Father God, in Jesus' name. So when he had taken a bread, he broke it. Again, I wish I had the monster. I would have, I would have done what he did and what they did throughout the generations before he came into the earth. But uh, when he broke it, I broke it off in pieces. But <laughs> when he broke it, half went into a napkin, and that's that was representing Jesus' body had to be resurrected. They only ate the half. And of course, monster was a pretty sized piece of bread. Well, actually, it's not bread because there's no lemon in it. It's more like a triscuit. More like a cracker. Yeah. Kind of like a stale tortilla. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. So anyway, Father, we thank you and praise you now because of what Jesus did for us. We thank you. We're covered and cleansed with the blood of Jesus Christ from all sin and all righteousness in Jesus' name. So he took the bread, he broke it, he said, take eat, this represents my body. So dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for every stripe on your back and your body, Lord Jesus Christ. You suffered so horrendously that we might be healed whole sound and well thank you jesus we accept it now and we'll all partake in jesus name then he took the cup he said this represents my blood oh thank god for the blood of jesus thank god thank god thank god because of that cleansing blood, he purchased us with his blood first Corinthians nine and first Corinthians six and twenty we've been bought with a price jesus paid a price for us he bought us and as he raised the cup, dear Lord Jesus, we accept what you did for us. We accept you as Savior, Lord, here, Redeemer, Deliver, Baptizer, and Holy Ghost, soon coming King. So, Father, we thank you. We are now sons and daughters of the Most High God. We're blood bought, blood washed, blood cleansed, blood protected. Thank God for the blood. All partake. Again, it's not just some. Thing we just do as we get ready to think of our tithes and offerings. Where am I going? Oh, Galatians chapter six, first of all, starting at verse six. Let him, let him as talk the word, share in good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. He who sows to the flesh will the flesh reap corruption, he who sows to the spirit will the spirit reap everlasting life. Let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And also, we also see in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, 8 on, or 9 on, 8 on, wherein will a man rob God, and Father, we choose not to rob you, Father God, you said by not bringing the whole tithe and the offering. Father God, that's the first fruit. So we bring our first fruits before you, Father God, this day in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to thank you and praise you ahead of time, Father God, in Jesus' glorious name. Amen and amen. Now, as you, if you have an envelope, or we don't, you need to start getting an envelope. If you have your offering, your tithe, just wave it. It makes, makes the devil mad. That's your wave offering unto the Lord. Amen. Makes the devil mad. But that's your, we used to do that quite a bit in, in DeWitt. I don't know why we don't do it here. It's my fault, I guess, but. That is the first fruit. So you're saying, Lord, because I bring in the first to you, everything behind is going to be blessed. He blessed, you give him the 10, you can be blessed in the 90% that's left. Amen. So he's still the God that's more than enough. You can't outdo God. You can't outgive God. Well, yeah, but you know, uh, I don't know that tithing stuff. Well, you don't have to, but God says we're supposed to. And also in Hebrews, we see that Jesus now is our great high priest. He ever lives to receive tithes and offerings. So he said in, in the earth, he said, men receive tithes, die. But there, Jesus ever lived to receive tithes and offerings. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> so Jesus, when he took the five loaves and two fishes from the little boy, Father God, we bring our tithes and offerings before you. So Father God, I'm going to lift them up to you, Father God. I'll wave them before you, Father God. 
their way of offering, Father God, and our way of offering in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the abundance of, uh, we sow our seed. We thank you for the abundance of harvest, Father God. We thank you for the multiplication of the seed that is sown in Jesus' glorious name. Amen and amen and amen. I don't know if I did that right or not. Am I, am I leaving something out? You know, oh, yeah, thank you. I do leave something out. Father God, we pray for every person within the sound of my voice that are watching, Father God. We thank you, Father God, that under our covenant, we thank you, Father God, because of your divine will and purpose and what Jesus did for us. I would ask you, Father, Acts 4 and 3, to stretch forth your hand and heal every person within the sound of my voice, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Touch them and heal them from the top of their head, the soles of their feet. Make them sound, healed, whole and complete, totally restored and complete. In Jesus' glorious name, Satan, take your hands off God's people. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In Jesus' name, be healed. In Jesus' name, receive. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen.